Future of oil is carbon negative, enabled by carbon capture, utilization, and storage. And that's what I want to talk about today. But before that, let's remember that oil by itself is a product of nature. Oil is a natural resource. We forget that. So let's see if we could summarize the history of the oil and gas industry in one slide. It all started when CO2 was captured and utilized by microorganisms such as microalgae and zooplanktons, and then they, then they were buried under layers and layers of rock, and with application of high pressure and temperature, the organic matter was deconstructed to form kerogen and eventually crude oil. So far, this process is all natural. Humans had nothing to do with this. Here's where we come in. We start drilling wells, and we produce the crude oil. From subsurface to surface, the product doesn't change. Then we build pipelines to transport the oil to the refineries, and eventually we would apply process engineering to produce the molecules that we want and are used to make everyday products such as polymers and plastics. When I see this, I see a very inefficient process and a lot of wasted energy. I don't think this is how we should be producing the molecules that we want in the year 2020. We have made a lot of improvements in the second part of the process. We have better drilling bits, we drill horizontal wells, we have advanced process control for refineries, but hardly anything has changed about the first part of the process. I mean, how could we? This is nature. It takes millions of years. I'm here to say that is about to change, and that's enabled by synthetic biology. Synthetic biology allows us to engineer microorganisms to produce the specific molecules that we want. It allows us to replace chemical manufacturing with nature-inspired biomanufacturing, and it has already disrupted many industries. Pharmaceutics was the first one, food and nutrients, that's why you could get an impossible burger at Burger King, and now it's going to cosmetic, fragrance, and even cannabis. In my last startup, Biota Technology, we commercialized DNA sequencing in the oil and gas industry, looking at DNA of microbes in the oil and in the rock, and building subsurface maps to tell operators where is the oil coming from. It was kind of like 23andMe in oil wells. Biology has the power to take in carbon dioxide from the air, energy from the sun, and water, and produce complex systems that could store energy, produce aroma, form complex structures, and also produce beautiful colors. What if we could harness the power of nature to reverse climate change and shape a new future for the oil and gas industry? What would that look like? Let's see. On one hand, we could use the CO2 that is already in the air, that is being produced by refineries, power plants. There's no lack of CO2. We could then feed that into engineered microorganisms and scale up the process to produce the molecules that we want. This way, we'll be eliminating a lot of the steps compared to the workflow that I showed for the history of the oil and gas industry. On one hand, since the method is nature-inspired, reactions happen under ambient pressure and temperature. Therefore, we save all the emissions due to high energy-intensive chemical processes. And since we use CO2 as a feedstock, the end products are carbon negative. Now, let me give you an example to make all of this very tangible. Let's say if we want to make ethylene from CO2. Turns out that in nature, bananas produce ethylene in the ripening process. And we have known of this for a long time. As a matter of fact, produce companies inject ethylene in their cold storage rooms um, to control and plan for the logistics of when they want the banana to be ripened enough to be on the shelf for the customers. Since it's 2020, we know the genome of banana and we know the exact line of code that is responsible for the enzyme that is producing ethylene. 
We could take that, we could integrate that into a microorganism that is efficiently using CO2 as a feedstock, and now we have a super microbe that could produce ethylene from CO2. We've done three things here. One, we've eliminated naphtha and ethane as feedstock. Second, since the reaction happened under ambient pressure and temperature, we have eliminated the energy cost of uh, thermal cracking. And third, because we've used CO2 as a feedstock, the end product is carbon negative. That's what the future looks like for ethylene production. And that's just one example. This is how nature and synthetic biology could be applied to make biomanufacturing economical. Why do we need to do any of this? Because the CO2 levels are rising, and now we know, because of the IPCC report and the Paris Accord, that reducing emissions alone is not enough. We also need to invest in and deploy carbon-negative technology. Companies with high carbon footprint that ignore this will become irrelevant in the next few decades. They will become irrelevant not because they're not profitable, but because they will get cut out of ESG criteria, environmental, social, and governance pool of investments, and they'll lose their social license to operate. So is CO2 a threat or is it an opportunity? I believe it's an opportunity if we learn how to use it as a feedstock. To put that in perspective, let's look at how humans have used different sources of carbon throughout history. In the 19th century, we used coal. Then we moved on to oil in the 20th century. And now in the 21st century, CO2 could be a good feedstock to fix the problems we have created, also paint a sustainable future. The question is, who is going to build the CO2 industry? Is it going to be the oil and gas industry reinventing themselves at the cost of cannibalizing themselves? Or is it going to be an entirely new industry built by newcomers? This is the classic innovator's dilemma that is happening now in real time. And this is going to give birth to a CCUS industry in the next 50 years. Carbon capture, either directly from air or from flue gas of refineries and power plants, CO2 utilization to then use that to produce the chemicals and fuels that we want, and CO2 storage. I give CO2 storage a thumbs down because I think the business model for it, it will go away because of the CO2 demand for utilization. Now with this context, let me share with you what we're working on at Samita Factory to play our role in energy transition. The story of Samita Factory is started with a simple idea, to mimic photosynthesis and use the CO2 that astronauts breathe out and produce glucose as a calorie source for deep space exploration. Two years later, we're building that system and it will be on the International Space Station hopefully next year. But we also saw the bigger picture and that's if it could go from CO2 to other molecules. So that evolved into our mission which is to create carbon negative economical solutions for a sustainable future. To see CO2 not just as a liability but as a resource and use it as a feedstock to build carbon negative products. So we assembled a team of scientists and engineers with backgrounds in energy and oil and gas and also biotech and synthetic biology guided by a world-class advisory board and we went to work. The platform that we've built uses CO2 as a feedstock to produce critical carbon negative intermediates which then are used to build a portfolio of products that are used in everyday life. We have 30 molecules that we could make from CO2. So we go to companies with high carbon footprint and we ask them, is there a molecule that you'll be interested in making from CO2 emission sources that you already have? Once we determine the molecule, we engineer the right microorganism to produce that molecule and then we scale up the process. Since the reaction happens under ambient pressure and temperature, we save all the energy um, compared to the chemical reactions that they're currently doing. We have a library of microbes 
with different capabilities. Most of these use light as a source of energy, and they have different capabilities which we'll choose for each specific application. We're commercializing this platform across three different verticals. In the energy industry, we're converting CO2 to chemicals. In the mining industry, we're applying carbon negative bioremediation. And finally, in the space industry, we're using CO2 as a feedstock to build regenerative life support systems. Now, let me give you a quick case study from each of these verticals to make it very tangible. In the energy industry, we're using CO2 as a feedstock from flue gas to produce a very critical carbon negative chemical. Uh, we've done that at the lab scale, and now we're scaling up the process. But what I wanted to share here is that when we did the techno-economic assessment using the assumptions from the client, we could see that we could utilize 1.5 megatons of CO2 per year to produce 500 kilotons of this product per year. And we do it at a cost of 30% less than what they're producing it today. And added bonus is that the product is now carbon negative. In the mining industry for acid mine drainage, which is a leftover of the mining process where contaminated water is stored in a pond, let's say with a pH of two, and it needs to be remediated. We have extremophiles that we could apply here that could degrade the heavy metals and increase the pH. In this case, we're able to increase the pH from two to eight. And when we do the techno-economic assessments, we could see that we could remediate one billion gallons of the contaminated water within a course of a year and a half or two years. So for a pond like this one on the left side that has three billion gallons of uh, contaminated water, we could remediate this in a course of five to seven years, whereas their own plan is to do that within the next 50 years. And finally, for deep space exploration, we plan to use the CO2 that astronauts breathe out as a feedstock to produce glucose, which then they could eat um, as a food source or use as a building block for biomanufacturing of more complex nutrients and pharmaceutics. We succeed only if we bring these pathways to life. And so from the very beginning, we have a special focus on techno-economic assessment and life cycle assessment for a scale up from test tube all the way to fulfill commercialization. And we do this in collaboration with our clients and with EPCs. What is the carbon removal capacity of our technology? If you could commercialize all the 30 molecules that we have coupled with two R&D projects, we could actually get close to one gigaton of CO2 utilized by 2050. And that's quite sizable. It's also good news, it means that there is hope to reverse climate change because we're just one small company and there is many others that are working on the same issue. I wanna leave you with one final thought. When you think about energy transition, the common story is that eventually solar and wind will replace oil and gas. The problem with oil and gas is emissions. CO2 utilization gives us a chance to solve the emission problem and create renewable and carbon neutral or even negative fuels and chemicals. And that's the untold story of energy transition. Thank you.